continue. Sorry, Shawnee. I just no problem. I just did it the way I would know how to do yeah. it. Uh, that works. Great. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 29th, 2020 based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using Zoom platform. My name is Christine Gray Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order as of 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take roll call. Board members, as you hear your name, unmute yourself and answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burtwistle? Yes, I'm here. Maria Chow? Here. Jack Jemsick? Uh, here. David Levenstein. Present, but remote. <laughs> uh, uh, Doug Marshall. Present. And Janet McGowan. Yes, present. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let the IT support representative or Pam uh, no. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to answer a question or make a comment. You will see your raised hand and call upon you and I will call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for the public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during a public comment period, you must join the meeting via a Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide. Uh, yep, it's there. Uh, and can be entered into a search engine by typing https colon backslash backslash zoom dot us backslash s backslash three nine six eight one nine four two six or cutting and pasting. The link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which is located on the town website in two places. One way is through the uh, calendar listing for this meeting from the home page. Uh, the town homepage, and then um, find the link with event details, and there will be uh, a link there. A second way is to go to the planning board uh, web page and click on the most recent agenda. Uh, on the agenda document, there is a link towards the top of the page that states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star 9 on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into uh, mute after you're finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Moving onward, the slide will sh now show uh, the meeting agenda. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link. As chair, I am taking the liberty to move public comment uh, agenda item number two to the end of the meeting. Uh, this will give the public additional time to log into Zoom and familiar, uh, familiarize themselves with the technology. Okay, so now we will move on with the meeting and looking at the agenda. Uh, we're going to go to item one, minutes. We have uh, two sets of minutes. We have March 4th and we have April 15th. Um, we'll start, how about we start with the older one, March 4th, uh, and I need to find my uh, screen so I can see hands. Hold on here. Hmm. 
Okay, so are there any comments uh, or suggestions, corrections that any of the board members see for the March 4th minutes? And I see, I recognize Michael, he has his hand up. I move to approve the minutes of March 4th. Okay, I see no other hands raised. Uh, is there a second? Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I think Janet had some comments. I don't know if you saw her hand being I do not see her hand. Her hand is not raised. Physically it is raised, but not um, symbolically. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Janet. It's too, because I don't even see you all on my screen. No, I'm, um, trying, to find, I, I, I'm trying to get us, I'm trying to get back to that bigger screen. I have I see most of us and I don't see where it says raise hand and I'm struggling. If, if you go to the bottom of the screen, it will highlight and you'll see participants. I, right now it says 14. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Yep. All right, participants, I, I clicked 14 and then ah, my hand raising and I will raise my hand somehow. Oh, raise hand, there we go, thanks. My, I had a completely different screen, a good strange green screen. Okay, thank you. So I believe you have a comment uh, about the March 4th minutes. So I have a couple. One is on page two, on the fourth paragraph. Which paragraph, sorry? On the fourth paragraph, it starts Attorney Reedy. And so I wanted to change um, the part of that first sentence that said of parking study data to two days of observation of parking. Cause I thought that was, you know, a parking study is sort of a different thing than just writing down cars in a lot on two nights or a morning as it turned out. Janet, can you repeat what you wanted it to say? Sure, I'll read the whole sentence. It says, attorney Reedy referred that Mr. Roblast provided documents that support the parking waiver request, including a sp spreadsheet of and I would write two days of observations of parking in lots. How about uh, a spreadsheet of parking data for two time periods? Yeah, I'm fine with that. I just think it's not a parking study. So I, I think because we're talking about doing a systematic study of parking. And so I thought that was kind of an, a, I didn't like the characterization of that. And then on the next page, um, I had made comments about my observations of parking on two days and that didn't- I'm Sorry, make... Janet, Janet, can you, you're on page three. Yeah. And what paragraph? Well, um, I'm not, well, it's kind of not there is I had made a comment during that discussion about parking that I had observed. I had done some parking counts in parking lots on two dates and it's not in there. And so I wanted that to be added to the minutes, although I didn't have, I mean, there are comments that I made, so I didn't act, I have notes of things I saw. I'm not sure exactly what I said. And so I talked to, I emailed Christine and she didn't have that down. So I think we have to go back and look, or some one of us has to look at it and see what that data was, because it did show a fair amount of parking use. Well, we then cannot approve the minutes. So you're proposing we put it on hold until the next meeting and some research be done looking at the video for what you actually said. Yes, yes. I will withdraw my motion then. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and you've got that, Chris and Pam? Yep. I do. Okay, so um, let's move, Luke, move on. So I had another um, addition of something that Mr. Bert Whistle had said, Michael had said during the discussion of the um, discussion of proposed draft zoning bylaw amendment process on page 15. It also makes me realize this was a very long meeting. It's very, and I remember Michael talking about being concerned that the planning board might wind up holding two meetings, public hearings, like one, when it was looking at a zoning bylaw, decided to hold a public hearing and then sent it to the town council. And then it would come back for a joint hearing, public hearing with CRC and the planning board. Okay, and why don't I open it up to Michael and he can give some feedback on it because you're, you know, and see what he's comfortable with or, or if he feels he needs to, um, or let me put it to you this way. Michael, you read the minutes. 
is are there items that you want to include that you stated that are not there right now? Um, on, um, there I am. On the, um, you're talking, uh, Janet. You're talking about the second paragraph under B. I think you know it, it's actually it's another kind of comment I remember, and it's not here, so it's not really. You know, I can't say. Oh, it, I don't remember exactly when it was said, but I remember you talking about this process that we were given might lead to more public hearings for the planning board. And then you raised a sort of different point that if, if there's a joint CRC planning board meeting when there's supposed to be two separate ones, it might mean that the public participation part isn't impactful. Like people, like usually the planning board holds a public hearing. We might take some take some in input, make some changes, and then send it to, in the old days, a select board and, and town meeting. And if we have a joint hearing, it might sound, I'm paraphrasing here, like it's already been baked and no one really, it's a public hearing for input, but it's already been decided. So I remember those two points, because I thought I, I thought about that a lot after you said them. Well, I recall making them, but I don't know where they would be. You know, I could go back and listen to the, these parts of the hearing because um, I just remember them, but I just don't, I can't say, oh, it came after, you know, Maria's comment or, you know, I can't say when it was, I just remember hearing it, so. Janet, can I, can I write, remind you something about minutes? Minutes just capture the general of the meeting, mostly importantly, taking on action items and votes and, you know, in the end, things passed and, you know, uh, transcripts, you know, that's why we have the videos. If people want the details, they can go and watch the whole meeting. You know, a me this, these minutes are already 18 pages long. If we turn, you know, and try to capture everything that everybody says, it's a transcript. So if we're missing something you said or Michael said, I could tell you there's like 50 things that I said that aren't in here, but that's not the point of minutes. Well, I think that, you know, when I, when I look at minutes, I mean, my experience with minutes and also looking at the um, open meeting law is like, so somebody who wasn't there can understand what was said. And so I thought these were important points. And I think they're actually important points because in my experience with the CRC is they're not getting what we're saying and we're not getting what they're saying. And so I think you know, if somebody read this, they would think, okay, this was a full discussion. And I thought those points by Michael were actually very important. So if you want, I can do is I can take these minutes, you know, add my changes in red, and then we can, I could send them out and then we could vote them on the next meeting. I would hope that would be the choice. I, I do, do any other members have any, feelings on this, um, you know, should Janet keep more to her comments that she made and where she feels she wasn't fully um, disclosed uh, or, uh, you know, captured? Um, you know, I, I just don't want just to get minutes done to get spinning that we're worried about what everybody said, because like I said, then it goes to a transcript. Um, we could look into, uh, Chris, we've talked about this before, about running this through some of the Google softwares to produce a transcript, um, which could be posted. Um, I just think minutes, like what you're saying, Janet, is people should be able to read this and get a feeling of the meeting, but not necessarily that they sat through a four-hour meeting. And I get concerned that minutes would start to become you know, over 20 pages, that's not good use of our staff time when it's being captured in other ways. I understand that you might feel that they're important parts. So I, I guess it's the prioritization. How important and vital do you feel that these comments have to be in the minutes? You know, it- Well, I, I'm bringing them up because I think they are important, yeah. It, well, there's important and there's like, we can't have these minutes finalized because it's vital. Um, Christy, I yeah. see Chris's hand is up, Michael. Oh, great, yes. Back. I will call on Chris Bestrup, thank you. So I think I'm unmuted. I just wanted to say, if Janet listens to the video and comes up with exact wording that she would like to include here, you could review it the next time around. I don't really have time to go back and listen to those videos to get the exact wording, but Janet could propose some kind of summary of exactly what was said 
and then we could include it next time around. Does that work? We can do that. Um, and when, so she'll submit these and then you'll incorporate them. Uh, can you put them in red or highlight yeah. them or something when the document comes back to us so we can go right to it? Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna call on Michael. Oh, no, Michael's gone. Uh, David. Uh, thank you. If, if a board member thinks that it's substantive and important to revise the minutes, I would encourage them to speak up. I think that it is, I take your point, Chris, Dean, that these are not transcripts, these are minutes. And so there should be a balanced judgment used. But if a board member thinks that, that it's substantive and should be edited, but, you know, and weighing a part of that balance is also the staff resources. So if, um, I appreciate that. I support Chris's suggestion and appreciate Janet's willingness to go back and, and propose um, uh, revisions, hope keeping, again, this, the, the balance of all of the resources and our re time. Um, uh, but, but if it's, there you go. If a board members think it's important, it should be uh, taken up and uh, the minutes can be revised. That's it, thank you. Great. Can I also um, bring up, we are given these minutes ahead of time in our packets. Um, maybe it would be helpful for people to save time to send the, their comments. If they have issues, you review the minutes and send them to Chris and then Chris can reissue the minutes. Um, you know, Chris, what are your feelings, you know, so that we, some of this might be able to be addressed before we actually get to the meetings. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Sure. As long as everybody's clear that, you know, these are things that so-and-so would like to change and then we'll bring them to the meeting and you can decide whether you want to change it or not. Yep. Right. I think then we'll know what to expect and we have a list and we can work off that. So if everyone can just try it then to be a little more proactive if they do have comments and we won't just leave it to right now. Okay. I'm looking at the hands. If there's any other comments uh, on March 4th, if there isn't, I'll give it a couple seconds. We'll move on to April 15th. Oh, I see Jack has his hand raised. I just want to say, um, I'm not an attorney, but um, there is a video of our meeting and can there be some sort of disclaimer at the bottom of the minutes saying that if you want the, you know, exact sort of uh, proceedings, refer to this video. Uh, that's all. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Thank you. That's also a possibility it, and send somebody in the right direction if they're looking for more. Um, I'm going to move to the April 15th minutes. Uh, again, I'm looking, does anyone have um, comments or additions to these? I don't see any hands, so I could also take a motion. Move to approve the minutes. And is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, so this is the first time we've done this. I guess I have to do a roll call to um, pass the minutes. So as I call your name, um, give your answer and then remute yourself. So I will go to Michael. Aye. Maria. Approve. Jack. Uh, approve. David. Yes, approve. Doug. Approve. Janet. Yes. And I also approve them. So we have unanimous, Chris. I think we're good with those. So we will move on to the next agenda item. Uh, Am I believe we have a slide? Yep, we do. I'm, I'm going. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, we moved public comments. So now let's try this one. There we go. So we're going to open the first public hearing. Yes, we are. Okay, so it is now 652. 
I'm going to move Tom Reedy. Great. Um, Amherst Planning Board, notice of public hearings. The Amherst Planning Board um, is holding a public hearing right now to consider the site plan review and special permit applications. Okay, so SPR, I'm going to open the first one, uh, the site plan review first. Uh, SPR 2020-06, Paul Shumway, 314 and 330 College Street. Request to modify SPR 99-0005 to cause uh, the existing multi-use building to exist on its own lot, lot two, and the existing shopping center to exist on its own lot, lot one, uh, commercial and BBC zoning district uh, map uh, 15A-24, 15A-97, and 14B-222. All right, first, I just want to ask, um, are there any board disclosures? And I'll watch for hands. Raise your hand if you have a disclosure. Uh, I am seeing none. Um, so we are going to move to the applicant who will give their presentation, which I believe is Mr. Tom Reedy. Um, is he set up? Do we hear, are you there, Tom? I'm here. Can you hear me? I hear you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I just see your name, but we hear your voice. And if you say next slide or backwards or forwards, um, Pam will drive those around. Sure. Okay. We only have, just so you know, Tom, we have these three slides. We have three slides. Perfect. That's all we need. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of Mr. Paul Shumway, owner of the College Street Shops, um, which is the subject of a couple of different matters in front of you this evening. We've got the site plan, the modifications of the site plan approval, which the chairwoman just mentioned. We've also got a couple of special permits, which we'll get to later. Um, and also uh, seeking the endorsement of a, an approval not required plan. So this parcel, um, or maybe I should say these parcels, there, there are three parcels all together. Uh, 15A24, 15A97, and 14B222. Um, the shopping center, that, that retail center, uh, with Kelly's on, on one end and then a vacant space on the easterly end is on 14B222, according to the assessor's map. And then you've got 15A24 labeled as 330 College Street, the, the building of um, a mixed use, it's a mixed use building uh, on its own assessor's parcel. And then you have kind of what looks like a, a flag lot, which is 15A97. And so they're all separate assessors parcels. But um, in about, I think it was 1998, Paul sought and was granted approval through site plan review for a mixed use building, which contains about um, 5,000 plus square feet and 12 residential units. Uh, that was issued by the planning board in 1998. And then there was a wetlands determination, there was a wetlands appeal, there was a superseding order of conditions issued, which was appealed. And at that time, the building was where the detention basin, if you've been out to the site, was where the detention basin currently is. And so as a settlement, what happened was the parties agreed just to flip flop the detention basin with the building. So the building ended up where it is today but it required um, a modification to that previous planning board approval. So in 1998, it was originally approved. In 1999, uh, Attorney McConnell went back and got a modification of that site plan approval to put the building where it exists today. But at that time, um, if you're familiar with the zoning, about where the back of that 14B222 lot line is, if you extended that all the way across the property, 
that's about where the zoning line is, which separates the commercial district, which is towards College Street, from what's now the BVC, Business Village Center Zoning District, which is to the rear uh, by Watson okay. Farms. At the time, uh, in 1999, it appears that the whole parcel was commercial because what happened was once that building ended up where it is today, the applicant needed relief because the building was gonna violate the side and rear yard setback. At that time in the commercial zoning district, the side and rear yard setback was 25 feet that building was going to be less than 25 feet from the side and the rear yard. And so this is kind of all by way of background and I think it's gonna feed into each of the pieces of relief that we're going to be asking for this evening. So the Zoning Board of Appeals um, granted that relief for the rear and the side yard setback to allow the siting of the building where it is. As part of that site plan review approval, however, it appears that the applicant at that time considered the entirety of all three parcels. And so when you look at all three of those parcels, you've got a combined lot area of 115,193 square feet. That affects directly the lot coverage, which we will get into later, and the building coverage, because that as a whole would form the denominator with the building coverage, so building on the entire site is 26,808 square feet, which represents 23.27%, which is less than, fortunately, both BBC and commercial have the same building and lot coverage requirements. It's 35% building coverage, 70% lot coverage. So overall, as a whole site, the building complies 23.27, and the lot complies, it's at 68.81%. And it's uh, 79,268 square feet of what lot coverage for the entire site. A couple of different considerations, um, and this is gonna lead into something that we'll talk about later. So I don't know when you wanna open that public hearing for the special permit piece of it. Um, but that's gonna impact the overall lot coverage and building coverage when we ask for this division. And so one of the things we're asking for is an endorsement um, uh, of an approval not required plan. And Pam, if you wanna to go to the next slide, that probably shows it better. And if you wanna maybe zoom in just a little bit, if Let's you could. zoom in? How do I do that? <laughs> maybe in view. I don't, it's next two over from slideshow and then the zoom. Okay. Is it doing it? Yeah, we, we can probably make do with that. And okay. if anybody needs to see it closer. Um, what if I go into I slideshow? Could you make it bigger? Sort of better. We all have paper copies of this, don't we? Yes. Oh, good. You do. That would be great if you can if you could look at that. Thank you, Michael. And I do notice some of the members don't have themselves on mute. Oh. So if if you're looking at um, the plan that's up in front of you, you'll see that what we're asking for is a division of that. Essentially, it's three assessors parcels, but it's being considered as one parcel for uh, permitting purposes. There's never been an 81X plan or a perimeter plan recorded. So really what we're looking to do is clean it all up. Part of that cleanup is to put each of these, you know, the shopping center distinctly on one lot, which is gonna be called lot one, and the mixed use center uh, on lot two and um, to, in order to do that, we need to modify the site plan approval so that it now runs with both lot one um, and lot two, so that each of them are on their separate lots. One of the things that I'll mention is 
when you're looking at, so we talked about the overall site and the overall lot coverage and building coverage for the overall site. When you look at just lot one, that also will, as an overall site, um, without regard to the lot line, the zone line rather, which if you're looking at the paper copy in front of you or if you're looking at your screen, you'll see that in green about at that rear of 14B222, there's a zone line where, to, as I mentioned, College Street is commercial, to the rear of that is BVC. So without regard to the zoning line, lot one complies, its building coverage is 25.8% and its lot coverage is 69.5%. Um, and then lot two complies where you've got a building coverage of 17.2% and a lot coverage of 66.3%. However, that's not the way you look at these. The way you have to look at these is BVC um, and lot coverage and building coverage within the BVC and then lot coverage and building coverage within the commercial. So that's really what is precipitating our request for relief through that special permit where we're asking for um, alteration or extension of a, a pre-existing non-conformity, which is the lot coverage and building coverage in the commercial zoning district. For the modification of the site plan review, I think as you'll see in your proposed findings, there are no physical changes to the site. We're not proposing any use changes to the site. We're not proposing any pavement, any pavement markings, nothing. It quite literally is just the lot line that is now dividing lot one and lot two. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I know that's a lot. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on that request or the, the ANR uh, endorsement. Thank you. Um, so I just want to ask Chris, we have three related uh, public hearings here and we've opened the site plan review and we have two others for a special permit. Um, should we open the other two or, Chris, are you there? Or um, just do it one at a time. Chris has a raised hand. She does, but she just has to unmute herself and she can, yeah. Well, I think it would be a good idea to join these public hearings together uh, for purposes of being able to discuss all of them at the same time. And then once you decide to um, close the public hearings, obviously you'd have to close each one. But we do have um, suggested findings and conditions, or findings and conditions for one of them and findings for the other two. So you'd have to um, vote on them separately but it might make sense to, to just have them all open now that it's after seven o'clock and all open and joined. That's what I was thinking because we passed the seven. So I'll open the other two and then we will move to the site visit report. Um, I believe Ms. McGowan is gonna give that. And then I'll, um, we'll just uh, stick to questions right now about well the, the site plan review. And then, yeah, Chris. So um, just make sure that you're going to read the description of the two special permit applications. I am. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so uh, 645, we had SPP 2020-04, Paul Shumway, 314 and 330 College Street, request special permit to modify um, by extinguishment, the existing special permit ZBA FY99-054 relative to the side and rear yard setback for the mixed use building map 15A-24 uh, BVC zoning district. And at seven o'clock, opening the public hearing for SPP 2020-05, Paul Shumway 314 and 330 College Street request special permit under table three footnote a of the zoning bylaw to modify the side setback requirement of the existing sh uh, shopping center to allow the reconfiguration of the lot into two lots and to alter the pre-existing non-conformity of lot coverage and building coverage to allow the division of the lots map 15a-24 15a-97 and 14b-222 
commercial and BVC zoning districts. So now we have all three open. Um, I'm gonna call on uh, the site visit in a moment, but I just wanna ask Mr. Reedy, do you have anything else you wanna add at this point? Not right now. I think you know we can get into the footnote A modification, the extinguishment, and then the lot building coverage after. But that's great. Good. Okay. So, um, and since I've opened the other two, I just want to ask the board: Are there any disclosures? I don't think I, I see no hands. So I'll call on um, Janet McGowan right now to give the site report, which I believe happened yesterday at four o'clock. Yes, am I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, so at the site visit, um, we saw that there was one, we, we walked around the entire lot, um, which has two zoning classifications. So we walked around the comm part and we walked around the business um, village center part. Um, in the commercial is the building that's in front along College Avenue. It, it has uh, eight small shops in the building um, and one of the shop spaces um, on the corner is empty. That is a potential place for a marijuana retailer. I think they have an application into the Cannabis Control Commission. The back section is um, behind that building was the um, kind of an, the, bit, the, bit, the area zone business village center. And it was, noticed, it was noticed that it was kind of like an island of zoning, um, um, kind of just hanging in there. And on that um, um, BBC is a building that has a few, a few stores on the first floor and then two stories of apartments. And there's 12 apartments up there. Um, and then like across from that to the west was what I would call a sump or now it's called a retention pond. Um, and so that was that. And there's a parking lot. There are parking lots all around the commercial building and parking spaces. And then to the west of the multi-use um, building, there were um, two lines of parking spaces. Um, let's see, what else did we see? Um, there's entrances and exits to the, to the um, entire lot on the west side and the east side of the property. Um, let's see, what else? Um, we Can I ask who was there? Oh, um, Michael Burtwistle was there, um, Christine Brestrup, um, Attorney Reedy and who am I forgetting? Um, Doug Marshall. Thank you. And then we, we kind of walked along where the proposed lot lines were and we saw that um, at the back of the commercial building to the east side, um, the lot line sort of angles off and it goes, you know, through partly where it's the detention pond, which is um, a little unusual. And the purpose of that lot line was described partly because it, um, the marijuana retailer, if it comes in, needs to be 500 feet away from um, the Fort River School. Um, and that, and then, so that was, I think that's the gist of it. I'm trying to think if anything else, if somebody wants to jump in with some more stuff, it'd be great. Uh, Michael, I see your hand. Yes, uh, there was one other thing that we did notice uh, that the parking, the, the driveway on the uh, east side of the building uh, would ultimately be some kind of uh, shared driveway. Um, the, the lot, the, uh, the curb cut on the, uh, on the west side would serve only the uh, uh, commercial building. The curb cut on the east side serves both the commercial building and the apartment building behind it. Mm -hmm. So there's a complication there of some sort. It's hard to know exactly what that means, but that is a difference. Excellent, thank you. Um, anyone else have anything? Who was at the site visit want to add anything? Um, I see, I, 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 Chris, you wave it, yeah? <laughs> I saw a hand wave, but. <laughs> So oh, I just wanted to mention that Mr. Reedy told us that the uh, mixed use building has four two bedroom apartments and eight one bedroom apartments for a total of 16 bedrooms. So I thought that was a, an important uh, point because we may be talking about parking a little bit later on. Chris, could you repeat that? Um, Mr. Reedy said that there were four two bedroom apartments and eight one-bedroom apartments 
um, for a total of 16 bedrooms and also 12 apartments. So four, four plus eight is 12, but there are 16 bedrooms altogether. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, at this point, open it up to questions from the board, um, either to Chris or Mr. Reedy, who you're looking uh, to answer, or either. I'll watch for their hands. Um, okay, I only see one hand. Uh, whoop, I see two. I'll call on Janet, and then next will be Michael. Am I unmuted? I'm, I hate to keep on asking that. Can you see your button? So if you click on that participants, yeah, oh, it says, and okay. it lists everyone you connect and the other places, if you go to the very bottom left hand side of your screen, it says mute and stop video and those are, you can control and toggle those. All right, I will get I will get into this thing. So for Mr. Reedy, could, could you reiterate for us what the nonconformity is? It seems to me from what you've said that um, for your entire lot, your the the property meets the um, lot and building coverage. So, what's the nonconformity on this parcel? Sure. So, even though the entire lot pre division and both of the lots post division would meet the overall building coverage and lot coverage combined. That's not how you look at it. Uh, the building commissioner looks at it per zone. And so within the BVC, and if you look at the site plan slash special permit plan um, that hopefully you have, and if not, um, Pam, maybe you could put it back up. It was that yep. slide that we were just looking at. We've sure. got the calculations shown um, right at the top in the middle. And so, perfect. So you've got the commercial district called out and the BVC district called out. If we go to the BVC district first, because that's gonna be compliant before and after, you'll see that the pre-division building coverage is 10.1%, which is under the 35%. And the pre-division lot coverage, which is 36.9%, and that is under the 70% lot mm -hmm. coverage requirement. Mm -hmm. So everything in the BVC complies. If you look at the commercial district, pre-division building coverage, already it, it exceeds the building coverage maximum. So it's at 35.1% where 35% is required. And then it exceeds the lot coverage. It has 96.8% when 70% is required. So both the building coverage and the lot coverage in the commercial district are those non-conformities that are pre-existing. Um, we're not looking to have any new non-conformity. And what we are looking to do is just to alter, extend, or enlarge those because of the drawing of that lot line. So that post-division, the lot one, building coverage within the commercial zoning district will be 40.2%, again, above the 35, um, and an increase from the 35.1 that existed prior to this redrawing of the lot lines. And then post-division lot one lot coverage will be 99.1%, which is up from the 96.8% that it existed as pre-division. If you look Post division for lot two building coverage in the commercial zoning district, it's zero because there are no buildings in that portion. It's like that access strip, if you will. Um, so that's zero, but the post division lot coverage is 81.5%. So that portion of lot two, which is in the commercial zoning district, is at 81.5% for lot coverage. So you can't just look at it as. BBC plus commercial, you've got to separate it out per zoning district. And it's when we separate it out by zoning district and specifically within the commercial zoning district, that's where prior, like as of today, um, prior to this division, the building coverage and the lot coverage both exceed what is otherwise allowed. And so that's what makes them lawfully pre-existing, not conforming. And that's what gives you the ability under 9.22 to 
to alter, extend, or enlarge those, provided that the the change. So it's I think it's 2.3 percent for the lot coverage and 5.1 percent for the building coverage. That those are not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing building and lot coverage in the commercial zoning district, not conforming to the requirements. So so. As a follow-up question, I actually follow what you're saying, I believe. And would it be e would your job be easier if the building inspector's interpretation was just, hey, this is one lot, you know, the building coverage is fine under both, you know, either or zoning district, and you're dividing it into two lots with and they're complying. Is that would that be easier for you? Because I wonder if this is a question for KP Law about how we should be looking at this. Should we divide one existing lot into like in mentally separate lots just because of zoning changes and then give them different coverages when as the entire the entire parcel now meets both zoning classifications. I'm just kind of lost on how we got from what I think is just logical to this more kind of detailed and difficult look. Chris, Christine Brestrup, do you have a... Um, I call on uh, Chris and then I see Tom has his hand up. Also. And Michael as well. Yes, Michael's next. I'm just trying to finish this Janet's um, questions and okay. then talk to Michael. Um, so, and so Chris, yeah? So we have always looked at um, lot coverage and building coverage and any dimensional requirements um, based on the zoning district in which whatever it is is located. So it's been a common um, interpretation of the zoning bylaw, both by the previous building commissioner and by the current building commissioner, that you have to look at the area that's in the zone, then you determine whether it meets the uh, requirements or not. And you can't um, just look at them overall if there is a uh, division and two or more zoning districts appear within one lot. We, we face this you know, numerous times. Um, I, I can give you the example of um, Applebrook subdivision, which is in two separate zoning districts. I think it's in RO and RLD, and we had to jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that the um, eight lots in that subdivision met the requirements for the zone in which they are currently located in. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Tom, do you have something to add? He is your hands. No, up. I think Chris. I think Chris summed okay. it up. And if I guess Janet, if your question is, mm -hmm. would it prevent us from dividing these lots? I would say no, because if you either way, there's an avenue for us to do this, whether it's through this pre-existing non-conforming, or if there was an interpretation that you looked at it holistically we could then divide it into lot one and lot two and both would comply with the zoning requirements as a whole so in either scenario we would be still requesting this um division thank you okay i'm going to uh thank you move on to michael i recognize thank you um i I want to ask a, a couple of linked questions. The first is, if if this division that you're proposing is approved, uh, will there be any kind of physical barrier between lot one and lot two? Uh, Tom? No, there will not. Okay. Uh, now, in case the lots were uh, fell into separate ownership at some point, which is at least part of what you were suggesting was the reason for doing this uh, division. If that were to be the case, if lot one was owned by someone and lot two was owned by someone else, uh, the, uh, the access to the lot one from the east side would be severely compromised. That would, it seems to me, would mean removal of all of those parking spaces on the east side of the shopping, of the uh, retail building uh, to provide access, a vehicular access to the back and uh, the side, the west side, of course, would have its own entrance, which is not a problem. Um, 
but it seems to me that those parking spaces would become unusable unless you were going to have some sort of uh, um, easement uh, from the owner of lot two to use the, their lot two's driveway to get into lot one's parking areas on the east side of the building. Am I correct in, in that so far? Um, yes, you are okay. correct. Uh, now, the second part of that is um, how many parking spaces uh, are required for the existing commercial building? Or is the losing of, it looks like 12 park parking spaces on the, east, on the east side, is that significant in terms of the number of parking spaces required uh, for, the, uh, for the retail building? Uh, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I don't know how many parking spaces are required for that commercial building. What I, I think, you know, in, instead of saying you're going to lose those number of parking spaces on the easterly side of the commercial building, I think, and like I've seen in the findings and like we talked about at the site visit, a condition, and I think practically this would happen anyways, of an easement from lot two as the servient estate to lot one as the, the benefited estate, um, allowing the passage and repassage by vehicles, um, persons on foot and otherwise, so that those parking spaces would remain and that there shall, and I think that's enough, you don't even have to put, there shall not be any physical impediments or infrastructure between the two parcels because if you were to put something up there, you would frustrate the intent or purpose of the easement, which would be illegal. So I think it's it's a simple fix. Um, and the planning board could impose it as a condition of this approval uh, where they would require an easement to be recorded and evidence of such um, to be provided to the planning department after it's recorded, should these fall into separate ownership. And frankly, this is something that I see often um, when we're dealing with this type of thing, I've dealt with it. I just dealt with it in Agawam for a Cumberland Farms who owns an adjacent parcel that they're looking to put a car wash on. And one of the conditions of the planning board was if the lots, um, are separated in ownership, then we will have to provide an easement showing access to, uh, that other site. Cause it was even a little bit, um, more intense than this, um, which, you know, we're going to be able to do. So I would suggest that an easement would be the answer here. I, I would I would agree that an easement as part of the condition uh, would be an appropriate uh, solution to what might be a problem, what probably wouldn't be, but conceivably could be. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. Are there um, any other questions uh, from any other board members? I do see Janet's um, up there, but this would be her second round. So I just want to make sure everybody else is covered. Um, I don't see any, so I recognize Janet. Here we go. So I have a, just to, re to ask that question again um, about how many spaces are required by the commercial building. Um, and I have like three, a few related questions. One is, I think that they, there's, there's 28 spaces that are for the mixed use building. And I'm wondering, and I know they they already have a parking waiver for the whole site. And so I'm wondering is what does the commercial building require if it was a separate lot? And then will you need to come back for two parking waivers because now you have to sort of get a new waiver? And then the observation is from, you know, driving by that spot a lot and actually using that, um, going to those stores a lot, is all those parking spaces along the east side, right close to Spirit House, not alongside the commercial building, are very frequently used by people who use those commercial buildings. And so I'm concerned that if we split those lots in two, there's like 22 spaces along that right-hand side kind of adjacent to the Spirit House parking lot. I'm afraid that that parking will be lost or could be in the future lost to customers of the commercial building and, and actually hurt the businesses there. So my question is, 
how many spaces would the commercial building require? And I know there's parking around and in the back. And then will there be, do you need to come back for two parking waivers or can we do a parking easement to allow um, people using that building access, the commercial space access to those spaces? It's kind of a bundle. Tom? Sure. Um, so thanks. As far as I, I don't know how many would be required in that um, commercial shopping center, you know, just with that singular building. I know that the decision from 1999 suggested that the entire site would need 156 spaces and the planning board granted a waiver for there to be 104 spaces, um, which is what should be out there today. I think that that is pretty good evidence. I've not seen parking overflow there. I think that there's sufficient parking. It was underutilized at the time. Um, and I think it's probably evidence of those waivers, you know, that waiver under article uh, section 7.9 working. Um, if the board, so I think it's sufficient. I don't think we have to come back for additional parking waivers. Um, if somebody in the future wants to have a different use in one of the spaces or proposes physical changes, then as part of that approval process, whether it's with the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board, they're going to discuss parking. I mean, it's just that's what happens in every town, but especially this town. And so I think it's going to be at that time that if they needed some to justify their parking or to show that there's sufficient parking on site, they would have to do it at that time. But Again, you know, besides this lot line reconfiguration, still being in the same ownership, um, you know, we think that there's sufficient parking. Thank you. I recognize David. Hi, I think that, thank you. I think that the, the criterion here is that the requested change is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity. Or, and I think that that would apply to the, the question about parking in the future. You know, right, there's no, there are no proposed changes to the commercial site except for the lot lines um, and the extinguishment of the, hold on. The, well, what, how would you say it? The extinguishment of the, or the, uh, how do you say it? The new nonconformity with the lot and building coverages, I think. Um, but I, I just don't see that. I've never seen this. There be a problem with parking there now, and there's no really substantial change to the proposed use or to the neighborhood, other than the the the, the technical lot boundaries. So I don't I don't see that the parking issue is for this application. Um, uh, that's significant. That's it. Thank you. Um, Michael? Yes. Um, I agree with Jack, or with, sorry, with David, that uh, it's um, not an impediment to any kind of approval. But I'm curious to know, uh, uh, Tom, you mentioned a uh, hundred and some parking spaces that were uh, Required or were uh, allowed by uh, by uh, a waiver. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, one hundred and four. Four uh, was what was allowed. Do you, um, know, do, you in know, do you know whether included in that one hundred and four are spaces in the back which are currently not lined? There's plenty of space to park back there, but there there are no parking lines and also that uh, gravel space on the west side of the building are those included in the 200 in the 106 spaces because it looks to me like there are 23 or four spaces in the front and uh, uh, something like um, uh, 15 or 16 on the side so i don't see yeah, how you I, I, yeah the gravel is certainly not included um in that i think the the parking along that um, on the northerly side of the zoning line, I think was included in that, um, but not that, not the gravel on the westerly side. Okay. 
Thank you. I recognize Jack. Yes. Um, whoops. Okay, I'm unmuted. All right. Um, we hear you. I'm wondering. <laughs> I was wondering if we could just like uh, uh, move to approve the special permit. Do the the SPR. Um, yeah. Are you proposing to make a motion? I am. Okay, so we uh, will handle these individually. Um, so your motion would have to close the public hearing for 2020-06 SPR. Correct and that you'd want to approve the request to modify Correct. the previous SPR? Correct. <laughs> you can read. <laughs> and, and with that really great motion, does anyone want to second that? I, um, there we go. Oh, I see a bunch of hands. Um, Maria, are, Um, sorry, is this the one that we need to say there's a condition where um, I think someone in the planning staff already drafted up that was sent today that if either parcel is sold, an easement would be provided over the 40 foot wide access strip to the benefit of owner of lot one. Is that part of what we're doing right now? Good question. I thought it was under the SPP. Chris, are you there? This is SPR 202006. Yeah. Uh, Chris, so I assume that condition will go under one of the special permits. I thought that special that condition should go under the site plan review because the site plan review is reviewing the division of the lots. And when the lots are divided, then the property line goes right, um, past the commercial building and cuts it off from the driveway. So there needs to be an easement over um, the lot that holds the little mixed use building in order to allow um, the commercial building to have access. So I thought that was an important part of the site plan review. Um, and I don't think it really relates to either of the special permits, but maybe I'm wrong about that. No, that's great. Um, thank you, Pam. If you, that slide you put up, I didn't uh, have a piece of paper. Hold on. Hold uh, on. So that was helpful. I only have the two that have SPP. Um, I think it was this one. Sorry, no, that's the SPP. Sorry, sorry. Pam showed the right one a minute ago. So uh, Jack, would you uh, agree that that should be added on to your motion? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, sorry for that oversight. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a motion on the table. I'll open it up to questions or if uh, other things need to be included. Um, I just remembered something, Chris, that I probably should take, let me just ask, let me check attendees. Um, Cause we only, I only see one, unless Pam, we have phone. Is there any public comment out there on just this SPR? I don't see any hands. Pam, any phone calls or? I have not, well, no, I didn't get any phone calls. Um, They're not, okay. They would, they would pop up into the attendees. So let's see. Part yeah, there's no, there's only one um, and I don't see a hand up. So I just, okay. good, I think we're clear on that. Um, so I'll go through, I see some hands. I'm gonna call on uh, Doug Marshall. Okay, um, I guess I have a couple of comments about the way the easement uh, condition is worded on SPR 2020-06, the draft that was circulated. And, um, whoops. Well done. Um, uh, sorry, Pam's pulling it up. Sorry, it was there. Um, so first of all, uh, it just says an easement will be provided and I, there are different types of easements, and I assume that what you meant was uh, an easement for vehicular and pedestrian access to those parking spaces that are along the east side of the building. So I thought that could be a little bit clearer. 
and then uh, the conversation about the parking spaces on the east side of that uh, parcel that are up against the uh, spirit house. Um, since those are essentially a resource or for the benefit of what would become lot one, I wondered whether the applicant would be willing to uh, provide an easement for the use of those parking spaces to uh, lot one activity as a, as a part of a condition. And I'll stop there. Uh, Tom? Sure. Um, so I guess, thanks Mr. Marshall. Um, two points. One, I think, yes, vehicular and pedestrian access to those parking spaces, but I think also to allow uh, circulation around that shopping center building. So uh, I just want to be careful about the planning board drafting something that private parties are going to end up drafting. So as long as it's general enough to get the sense of what you're looking to allow, I'm fine with the condition, which leads me to the next point that I don't think that, I don't think we'd accept the condition or we um, would respectfully request that you don't impose a condition relative to designating any of those parking spaces um, for the use of lot one. I think that might, I, I would suggest to allow the free market to decide how those parking spaces are going to be used. Um, especially with, you know, we, who knows if the residential tenants end up parking along that area um, in its entirety because the commercial uses at the first floor of the mixed use building are such where they need to have parking for people right out in front. So it, it might be a business decision by the landowner at that time where he wants to use the parking spaces that way. If there's a parking issue, um, I'm always of the mind that the, the free market will decide. And if the parking's not working, people are gonna get together and figure out how to make it work. Um, so th those would be my responses to those two points. Um, Tom, did I hear you say earlier that the, to the condition of the easement, uh, something about recorded and provided to the planning department if properties, um, if they go into separate ownership. So yes. that's the calling for the easement if the properties become owned by two different people. Correct. Because I think when one person or one owner, they probably let the parking share for the most part. Yeah, and they can't as a legal matter, they can't grant an easement to themselves. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, so Chris, I think your hand is up. Yep. So um, I wonder if Pam would show the um, conditions and findings for um, 2006. Mm -hmm. Because that's the one. Oh, 2020. Yeah. Oh. This in review. That's the one we're talking about. Yeah. Isn't that what I had up there? Earlier, Earlier I think you did. This. Had it up there, yeah. 2006. This? What, not, not what's showing now. Okay, so what's for now? No, I'm seeing 06. Okay. Let me see. I see 2020-04. That's what's up. This is 05. I'm not seeing that either. No, you're not. Um, okay. It's not right. reading that part of your screen. I, I think you're going to slides. I don't have that in the slides, Christine. So hang on. Oh. So go, yeah, go out and then go back in, and it should give you that white window with lots of options. Mm -hmm. Can Yay. you see it now? Oh, oh six, you got it. Yeah. Oh. I'm sure okay. on that whiteboard, they all look the same, you know, and blurry. So, yeah. No, somehow I didn't have it up there for you guys because I was looking at it. I've been looking at it for as long as Doug was talking. So I'm sorry. Thank you for, <laughs> for saying something. Okay, great. Chris, yes. Well, I wanted to ask um, the board about the conditions that we have here. One of the conditions is that... Um, the conditions of the previous site plan review be carried over for both of the new lots, although I didn't really make that explicit. 
And the second one was that an easement be granted. And I wondered if Mr. Reedy would offer us some language for that condition so that it's um, broad enough so that it could um, encompass the things that Mr. Marshall talked about and the concerns that other people have raised. Um, Tom? Sure. Um, so I would think that it's upon <laughs> separation of ownership between lot one and lot two, or of lot one and lot two, lot two shall grant to lot one sufficient, an easement sufficient for access and circulation to lot one to allow continued use of the parking spaces on the easterly side of lot one for both uh, pedestrians and vehicles and to ensure yeah I, I mean I could just send it to you Pam if somebody wants to make the motion and we can make sure that it that it, that it works I mean it, it'll be pedestrian vehicular um, access and circulation to okay. ensure efficient operation of the site something like that we get what you're saying Sure. But you're going to put that in writing, Tom, and send it to us. Yeah, I can get that. I can get that to you tomorrow morning. You're great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. okay so the second condition will be, per the final write-up, agreed upon between uh, Mr. Reedy and Ms. Bestro. Okay. And I just wanted to go back to whether you agree that the conditions of the previous site plan review should apply to both. Um, properties and also to ask Mr. Jemsek who made the motion to approve if he agrees that um, all the relevant uh, sections of or some criteria in section 11.24 are met by this granting of this modification of this site plan review. Jack? Oh, sounds good. Sounds good by me. Okay. Um, so that covers that sheet and we have a motion on the table um, and I do see uh, Tom do you have something to add no yeah I just okay when we're talking about modifying um, SPR 9904 and having it run with the land when you look at some of the conditions of that original site plan review some of them are just not going to be applicable to that new yeah. lot one um, so I don't know if you want to restrict it to lot two or just say as applicable, you know, however the board wants to do it. I just, I'm just thinking of 10 years down the road when, you know, who knows who, who from this board is going to still be on it or if I'm still doing this and saying, you know, what was this really about? So just the more clarity, the better. Uh, Chris, do you have a comment on that? Cause you were the one saying tying it to both. Yeah, uh, I would be happy with saying as applicable or, um, you know, it really applies to, I guess it applies to lot two. Isn't that correct? It applies mm -hmm. to the lot with the mixed use building on it, right? Yeah. So yeah, and there's, there's one like condition seven, which talks about a traffic island with two 40 foot entrances, entrances yeah. shall be constructed along so College that Street. So that's wouldn't be relevant right. anymore. No. So as applicable, sounds I fine. I think that's fine. So word it yeah. that way. Okay, so we've got through that. Uh, for um, additional questions on the motion that's on the table, I recognize Janet and I see no other hands. Janet, you have a question? Maybe not. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to read the conditions that came sort of late and I'm not sure what they are now, and I'm not even sure what the motion is at this point. And I know we have three different actions to take. And so here's my plea for talking out some ideas and then continuing to the two weeks. So we, we actually, I don't really, I don't, I'd be so uncomfortable voting right now because I'm very unsure what we're voting for. Um, I, I, I actually want to speak in support of Doug Marshall's idea of having an easement and access to those parking spaces that would be part of lot two along 
um, the east side of Spirit House. Um, you know, we don't know how much parking is would lot one would need. I'm, lot one would need for the, its commercial building. I know those spaces are used by customers to the commercial building. And I went to the marijuana, um, the hearing, uh, at the hearing, um, a public meeting on the facility that is trying to open in that building. And they were expecting their peak um, traffic to be around rush hour, which is also the peak time for use of mom's house and also the neighborhood market. And so I think that there is, there's a detriment to the neighborhood as well as those businesses if those, if, if, if they, if, you know, members of the public in the neighborhood didn't have access to them. And so I support um, adding that to the easement and just have people work it out. Maybe there's 22 spaces along there. I guess, it, you know, I, I counted them today. And I think eight, Mr. Reedy had said, were needed by the, um, by the people in the mixed use building. So maybe, you know, 22 minus eight could be in that easement to make sure that those building, those businesses are viable and can and their customers can use the building. I think that's very important. Um, if people don't support that, I would like to know before I vote how many spaces would be required under our bylaw for that commercial building. Because there's eight businesses or seven businesses there, and I wouldn't want to hamper their ability to operate and their customers to use it in the neighborhood also. So. Um, that's my, I just, but getting back to my first point, I don't really know what the motion is or what the conditions are under each permit. I'm kind of lost. And I would like maybe a, to see that written in um, some time to reflect. Okay, maybe I can clarify a little bit for you, Janet. Um, the motion is if you look at the public hearings, um, we close the public hearing for the site plan review and we would approve the request to modify the SPR and if you just read it there, we're just approving what the hearing is about. And then there's two conditions. And can you see them on your screen? Yes, but I'm not seeing what Mr. Reedy is going to add in the, um, the Well, just and also to remind you, you know, right now the two parcels have the same owner. The easement only gets triggered if one of those lots is sold and they're different owners. Because right yes, now it's the same owner, so there it's all the same ownership on parking. Um, just, I just want to make sure you, you were uh, saying you weren't sure where we were at. Um, so uh, Mr. Reedy can give uh, <laughs> his little, um, maybe he's been scribbling something down. I know Chris did too about that number two. And we just made the smallest reference on item condition one about how it's lot two but what was the wording, Chris, uh, for that, if it's, we ended up with? I have something like, um, under upon separation of the ownership between lot one and two, lot two shall grant to lot one an easement um, sufficient for access and circulation to lot one to allow continued use of parking spaces and pedestrian vehicular access and circulation um, to ensure that uh, the efficient operation of the site. So the way I interpreted to allow continued use of parking spaces was the continued use of the parking spaces that's in the uh, strip, the 40 foot wide strip that leads back to the mixed use building, that those uh, could continue to be used by um, lot one. Tom, does that sound right? I don't know if I would go, well, first of all, Ms. Brestrup did a fantastic job of understanding uh, what I was trying to say. So kudos. Um, but I don't know that I would read it or would suggest it as broadly as allowing or requiring an easement to those spaces along the Spirit House side. Um, again, I think that's something to be dealt with by private parties at the time and based upon whatever uses are, are in the shopping center and in that mixed use building in the back. I just, I don't, I think it's dangerous for the planning board to try to regulate that at this time, um, especially when there's no separation of ownership. And there's no known plan for that in the near future. Correct. Correct. So it could be a couple of years, it could be 10 years and correct parking could be completely different then. What's the downside of doing that um, kind of easement for the future? Um, 
so just than, do, doing many commercial transactions. Um, you let the parties figure out the business terms. And I think by re requiring something like that, um, it adds another layer of potential uncertainty, especially if then you have to go back to the, to the planning board and get something approved or have a conversation with the planning board about get some, getting something approved. Um, and so it, it can chill sales or it can chill folks who are looking at getting through the process quickly. And so it's just, I, I think it's best left for folks who are actually going to be there on the ground, um, actually using the site, whether it's an investment or otherwise. And if, you know, I think all of the tenants have redress if let's go down the road and say the, the parcels are separated and there is insufficient parking on lot one for the uses. One of a couple of things is gonna happen um, and it's probably going to be those tenants talking to the landlord and saying, you know, what the heck, how come I don't have enough parking spaces? I'm going to need parking spaces. And then the landlord's going to go to the owner of lot two and say, I need some. And then the owner of lot two is going to say, okay, but you're going to have to pay X, Y, and Z. And so I think letting that happen organically is, is important. Um, instead of the planning board saying, we're going to tell you how to operate. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to recognize Doug. Thank you. Um, having heard the, the alteration of condition two that Chris uh, read to us, I was completely on board with what she read, um, except that I interpreted Tom's original intent to that 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 easement and the benefit of access was for the use of the spaces that are on the east side of lot one, not the spaces that are on the east side of lot two. I agree. I guess I would also say that I will defer to Mr. Reedy in terms of the possible detrimental effect on on the businesses in lot one if the parcels are separated and uh, they they no longer have access to the parking on the east side of lot one, up lot two rather. So Chris, I can't see you on my screen right now. Um, have you adjusted that writing? Let me try to read faces. Hold on, I can't. <laughs> there you are. There she is. I'm not muted, no. Um, so I have not adjusted it, but let me see if I can. Upon separation of ownership between lots one and two, lot two shall grant to lot one an easement sufficient for access and circulation to lot one to allow continued use of parking spaces on the east side of lot one. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Period. Um, uh, and pedestrian and vehicular access and circulation to ensure the efficient operation of the site. So I think this needs to be, I, I need to draft it and I need to send it to Mr. Reedy and find out if that's what he meant and then send it to board members and find out if that's how you understood it. Unless somebody wants to take another crack at it like Mr. Reedy and uh, just say it all over again. Tom? I, I thought that was perfect. I think with that little clarification about with reference to those parking spaces on the easterly side of lot one, I think that accomplishes exactly what we're talking about. I agree. Um, I don't see any hands right now. Oh, um, Janet? I would support this 
whole process, if I knew that there was sufficient commercial parking for the commercial building, um, and that that was guaranteed in the future. And so I still feel very uncomfortable not knowing how many, I know there's parking in the back available. I just don't know what, how many spaces are left and if it's, you know, 20% less than it's required by our bylaw. Um, I would love to ask people who own those businesses how important they think those spaces are along the, the east side of Spirit House and get their impact because they're, they're part of the neighborhood. And so the only detrimental I can see to the neighborhood is the loss of those spaces by the commercial building. But other than that, I'm completely on board. You know, I know people buy and sell property all the time with odd easements. It would probably, it could reduce the value, um, you know, of lot two, but I also think it's going to prevent problems in the future. And um, instead of, you know, I could see those problems easily. And I just would, you know, that's just my point. So those are my thoughts. And I would love to wait for two weeks just to see the language that we're voting on and have some time to reflect on it. Okay. Jack? Hello. Um, so based on the comments there, I, I don't agree with Janet's last set of comments there, um, but I do agree with what Christine, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Christine uh, mentioned as well. And then Tom Reedy, I think acknowledged that. So uh, again, with those amendments, I would move to, uh, to vote on this. Okay, thank you, Jack. Chris, um, your hand is up. Do you have anything to say, Chris? Oh, I forget what I had to say. All right. For Raise your hand again if you need to. Um, David, whoop, hands are flicking around. David? Hi, thank you. Um, may I make a suggestion that uh, I don't know the rules of order so uh, at all, but but that the motion I would, in deference to Janet and to the the, the confusing, uh, um, not so confusing, but just the, the 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 abstractness of the discussion, that I would su propose that we uh, that a motion to approve the site plan review, and that that we will consider revised conditions reflecting that approval at our next planning board meeting. I, I, th I think that that meets the, meets the concern that Janet's raising about the language, but, we, but, but the parties know that or the applicant knows that, that we're moving forward favorably for that. That would be, that's my suggestion if that flies. So are you Thanks. saying, David, you're uncomfortable with voting right now, even if if we read the read the motion again? Um, for the two conditions. No, I'm comfortable voting for them, but I'm trying to meet meet uh, 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 Janet's concern, and mm -hmm. and I think that we and think that voting to approve the motion. I'm just not Separate. sure what we're waiting on because we have the wording, we just don't have it written on a slide. Um, why don't I hear what Michael and okay, yeah. Jack Thank said, you. but I hear you. Thank you, David. Um, Michael? Yes, I'm, I'm comfortable with voting now. Um, I think uh, Janet's point is well taken, but on the other hand, uh, there's not gonna be any change in the number of parking spaces no matter what we do, it's going to still be what it is now. And uh, what we're basically approving is a, a redrawing of the lines. And there's going to be no physical change to what's going on in the buildings. If in the future there is a change, if one building is sold and the other one is not, or if both buildings fall into different hands, then the parties have to negotiate what's going on with the parking. Uh, it seems to me it's pretty simple. And I think the original uh, condition number two that, that Chris drafted this afternoon uh, is fine. I think the one that is now, uh, we're now working on is also fine, uh, but I think we're making more out of this than is there. So I think we should vote on this and move it on. Thank you, Michael. I recognize Jack. Yes, I, I just want to apologize. I, I, I felt like I called Janet out there and that was like, I would never do that if we were actually in our regular planning board 
you know, setting. So I just, <laughs> I am sorry for that, but, uh, but I agree with Mike. Um, I hope we can vote on this. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Um, I see no more hands uh, right now. Um, I, I will just put it out there. Are there any other members right now who are uncomfortable with taking a vote right now on this SPR? I'm watching for hands. Um, I see David's hand up. No, I'd second, oh. second the oh. motion to vote for approval. Okay, all right. So we have the motion. Um, I will do a roll call for, um, maybe I can do this off of my head. Um, I'll start um, with Michael. I approve. And Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. And Doug. Approve. And um, David. Approve. And Janet. Could you read the motion? Can you read it again for me? Uh, sure. Read the, read the condition for me. I can't. It's not. Can you read the condition? Um, sure. Chris or Tom or Chris, I think, has. Chris. Um, there was just a small add-on on the, the first one. Um, Mute. Okay. Am I yeah, unmute? There you are. Oh, if you can just read the two conditions for Janet. The first condition, um, let me see here. Uh, that the conditions of the site plan review decision for SPR 9904 shall remain in effect for lot two. Okay. Thank you. And that um, upon separation of ownership between lot one and lot two, lot two shall grant to lot one an easement sufficient for access and circulation to lot one to allow continued use of parking spaces on the east side of lot one um, and pedestrian and vehicular access and circulation to ensure sufficient, op or excuse me, efficient operation of the site. Okay. I'm just going to abstain. Thank you. Okay. And for my vote, I approve. So we will move on to the two special permits. I'm going to open it back up to Mr. Reedy. Um, I assume you want to dive deeper on those two. <laughs> Do I want to? Um, <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, do you want uh, a certain slide up? Uh, yeah, maybe Pam, if you could, the second to the last one. So the one that is the site plan slash special permit slide, please. It's the colored one. Correct. This. Can you see it? Not yet. We see you. <laughs> Can you see it just now? Beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Is Great. it big Thanks. enough? Yes. It's big enough. Okay. So maybe we'll take the low hanging fruit first. So if you look at the easterly side of lot two, so that mixed use building, uh, as you'll recall from the beginning, I talked about how uh, the applicant needed a special permit because it violated the side and rear yard setbacks uh, as it was located in the commercial zone. It is now located in the BVC zoning district. BVC requires 10 foot side and rear yard setback and this building complies with both. So technically what we need to do is and what we've done is requested a special permit to modify the special permit by extinguishing the special permit. And so the, the building as far as side and rear yard setbacks in the BVC is compliant. Um, so hopefully that one's a, a pretty simple one. And then the other special permit is both for a footnote A modification. So you'll, if you look at the plan, you'll see that coming off of College Street, the lot line division, moves northerly in a straight line and then jogs to the northwest at an angle and then continues uh, 
um, in a more severe northwesterly angle. The distance from the corner of the existing shopping center to that property line is 24.7 feet, where 25 feet is required. And so in the commercial zoning district, in the dimensional table, um, under footnote A, you are allowed to, under a special permit, grant this modification to the side yard uh, setback. And so our suggestion is that, that it's A, de minimis, but also you've got the spirit house, which violates the, is already less than the side yard setback. I think spirit house is about 15 feet. City tire, which is on the other side of Shumway Street is uh, 20 feet. And then the subway building adjacent to the Dunkin' Donuts. So at the corner of Shumway and College Street is about a uh, little less than 25 feet. So those are all examples in the neighborhood of building existing buildings that do not comply with the side yard setback. So we would request a, a special permit approval for that request. And then we, we talked about the um, alteration, extension or enlargement of the pre-existing nonconformity. And that's when we went through that commercial district pre-division, post-division and the increase, and as uh, Doug put it yesterday, it's because the, the denominator is changing. And when you're starting with um, you know, the entirety of the commercial district on this site, and then going to um, a commercial district that is smaller, then really it's that access way. Um, it, it just mathematically increases the percentage because the denominator is decreasing the the numerator um <laughs> essentially staying the same so yeah we end so we end up with just a higher percentage based on math and the way the, the lot lines are drawn so our suggestion is because there's no physical changes um we're not adding pavement we're not adding building we're not doing anything like that that it's it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, and they're both de minimis There was math in that. Tom, you said 25 required. Can you repeat the first number, what, what this ends up? 24.7. Uh, 20, that's what I, so really close. Yeah. Okay, thank Correct. you. Yeah, very close, very close. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I do see Chris Bestrup's hand up. I wanna see if she has a, it, it's, <laughs> it's all right, just turn your hand off, great. All right, um, so I see David has his hand up. That was a mistake too, sorry. <laughs> okay, so at this time, do any members have questions to Mr. Reedy or Ms. Bestrop? And I see none. Um, I'll take this moment to just check to see if we have any public comments. Um, I don't see any attendees with their hand up. Pam, are there any phone call questions? Not that I am seeing, okay. no. Okay, great. Um, so back to board members. I see Michael has his hand up now. Well, I'd like to move to close the public hearing for uh, uh, SPP 2020-04 and, and SPP 2020-05 mm -hmm. and, and approve both of those special permit requests. Second. Um, Chris, should we pull up? We had findings. Uh, thank you. Is there a second to that for anyone? Sorry, I had seconded it. Oh, it. great. Thank you, Maria. And, uh, I should, and I should have said with the conditions as drawn up by the planning department. Okay. Um, Pam, if you can pop up. So that's on the table right now. Yes. We can pop up four and then five and just give them a peek. Oh, I don't know how to share two at once. No, just you can go with 04 first. And, oh, this one's a five, I think. Oh, that's a five. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> this is why I like slides. I should shouldn't have said with the conditions. I should have said with the findings. Finding. Yep. Sorry. No, that's good. We're good. 
SPP04, this right here. Can you see it? Not yet. We see you. Okay. Are you sharing your screen? I'm trying to. It's Can I not make a comment? I have so many documents yeah. open that it's not showing them all. Well, we I all have this I'm... in paper, don't we, in front of us? We do. We have oh. them. Um, so I can, while well, you're fighting with that, Pam, um, and I can recognize Doug if you want to say something. I was going to say if you have your papers you can read through them and if there's a bullet item that you have a question or want to bring up um, just click your hand. Michael you do have your hand up right now. Sorry. No, nope, no problem. <laughs> um, all right Janet just said I've oh geez Janet's having a technical issue so hold on here. I've lost everything but a picture of you. I can hear also. That's what she says. I don't know what that quite means. Um, Janet, if you're in doubt, you could leave the meeting and then come back in. She's probably on speaker view now. Yeah, That's I can speaker. see her. I'm gonna, I don't know what control I have right now. Um, okay, so Janet, can you unmute yourself? Can you go down to the lower left-hand corner? Can you toggle I, that on and off? Yes, oh, yeah. I just, so, I just randomly clicked on an arrow and everybody came back. Okay. Okay, great. All right. you left, but you're back. <laughs> I'm glad, good. Um, okay, so um, I don't see any hands up. Chris, you have your hand up. Um, does anyone have any particular issues with the draft findings for either 04 or 05 special permits? I see none. Chris, do you have something to say? I just thought I could read through them. And um, sure. Essentially. Oh. Yeah, Pam, I, of course, as soon as you say that, she's going to, oh, she's got the six again. All right. <laughs> you know what, Pam? Why don't you try to bring up 05 and Chris, if you want to read the 04. Yeah, I will read 04. Oh, yeah. There's 04. Doing... All right, Chris, cancel that. Pam's got that. All right, take a breathe. Take a deep breath. You did good. <laughs> um, Why don't we do them anyway, just so everybody's heard them and everybody knows. Is that okay? Sure, go for it. Okay, so these are taken from the 462 Main Street when we extinguished a um, special permit on that property. So they're essentially the same conditions, just reworded to the current case. So the board found under section 10.33 of the zoning bylaw, modification amendment or renewal, that the extinguishing of the previous and current special permit ZBA 9954 is consistent with the purposes and intent of this bylaw and a public hearing has been held. Now my internet connection is unstable. That the special permit <laughs> had been granted when the property was in the commercial district, commercial zoning district. That the special permit was required for modification of side and rear yard setbacks when the property was zoned commercial. That the zoning of this property has been changed to BVC Business Village Center. That therefore a special permit is no longer needed for the side and rear yard setback that exists on the site. Thank you, Chris. Um, I see Doug's hand is raised. I cannot hear you, Doug. Snap, put, um, mute, oh uh, yeah. I was gonna make a comment about uh, the, the S SPP 2020-05. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe we're not there yet. We're not, I'll call on you, put, keep your hand up and um, I'll call on you after we read through the 05. So I don't see any other hands up, so I think we're okay with those. Uh, Pam? Yes. You wanna switch out? Um, and Chris, you can start reading them if you want. Okay. So um, there were two special permits requested here, one for um, a modification under footnote A, and that had to do with uh, side yard setback for the large commercial oh. building. Um, That's 06. So yep. The board found under footnote A, table three of the zoning bylaw, 
that the modification of the side yard setback is consistent with the purposes and intent of this bylaw and a public hearing has been held. That the side yard setback modification being requested 24.7 feet versus 25 feet is minimal. That there are existing buildings in the surrounding neighborhood that exhibit the same or less setback in the commercial district in which this building is located. And I would strike Cerner Oil and add um, City Tire in its place. Um, and then the second part of that is the board found under section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw that the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functional or visual relationship thereto. Thank okay. you, Chris. Um, yeah. I, uh, uh, I revised this and sent it to you <laughs> like five minutes before the meeting started um, to uh, acknowledge the, um, the special permit under section 9.22 that the alteration of the lot line and its impact on the lot and building coverage is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, since there are no proposed changes to the buildings or pavement of the property, but only a change in the lot line, there will not be a perceived difference in the lot or in the impact on the neighborhood. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Pam, for getting that up there. Um, Doug, I recognize you. Okay, uh, my, my comment was simply that I would hope there would be a more permanent way for us to reference the three uh, uh, properties that contain Spirit House, Cerner Oil, and Subway. Um, you know, those occupants could turn over pretty quickly and- Good point. Nobody's gonna know who, where, where that is <laughs> in five years. So, Excellent point. You know, let's let's reference parcels or addresses or something more permanent. That's all. Yep. Or if yeah. you don't mind, Chris, putting both. It's nice to have the visual, but absolutely, yep. its proper name is vital. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions on uh, the findings for 0405? And I see no hands. So we do have a motion on the table. Oh, uh, Janet. Janet, you're um, muted, I believe. Yes, you are. Um, I had a question for Christine Brestrup about um, footnote A, does it apply to the comm in, in terms of the side yard and setback? Because I didn't see that it was. And I was, I, I think this is a very de minimis change, it, it, but I just didn't understand. It looked like footnote A didn't apply. So I just wondered about that. Is the building, is the commercial building in the commercial zone? We're talking about the setback of the commercial building from the new property line and the yeah, commercial and building thought, in the commercial zone. So, so I didn't see footnote A applying to COM in that, yeah. Footnote A doesn't apply to COM. Uh, well, Chris, sure I... Look, I, I'm going to call on Mr. Reedy. I do see his hand up. He might. So, yeah, if you look at the table three dimensional regulations, um, you go to the basic minimum side and rear yards. And if you follow that across and then you look down from com, it's 25 feet and next to it, it has that footnote A. Okay, I'm seeing that. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, I see no other hands. I believe we're ready for a vote. Um, There's been no second to the motion. Didn't we get a sec? Did Maria second? Maria. Maria yeah. Chad. Yeah, Maria. I seconded. Sorry. Because I waited you. for a second, then it's on the table. We've had our discussion. I don't see um, any public comment. No other hands. Um, Chris, can we vote? Should, do I, I should roll call twice? Break out, do 04 and then 05? Yes, yeah. Okay, so we'll have to do this twice, everyone. Um, so we'll start with SPP 2020-04. And I, uh, Michael? Yes. Maria? Yes, approved. Jack? Approved. David? Approved. Doug? 
Approve. Janet? Approved. And myself, I also approve. So we have 700. And I'll move now to SPP 2020-05. And starting again, Michael? Approve. Maria? Approve. approve. Jack? Approved. David? Approve. Doug? Approve. Janet? Approve. And I also approve. So seven zero zero. Okay. Nicely, nicely done. That was a lot, the three. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Uh, Chris, Thank is there anything everybody. else or can I move on? You can move on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Thank you. Good seeing everybody. And if Pam could just pop up the agenda for a moment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So. Just to show where we're at. We're here, number four. Okay, so um, item four is old business. A is review and consider the, uh, the discussion at the CRC meeting of April 15th regarding the process for amending zoning bylaw. And um, Chris, I assume that you'll give us a summary of that meeting. And um, a link was provided to us through, I think it was YouTube, but Amherst Media. Um, and I, I know a few of us did watch it. I did. Oh. Um, Ms. McGowan, Janet McGowan asked me to um, give a little summary of what happened at that meeting. And um, I would say uh, a, a few things were discussed. It was actually discussing it was about an hour long. Um, and they kind of went back over um, their suggestion or recommendation of a few months ago, um, which outlined a process for um, amending the zoning bylaw and kind of started to question uh, what they had proposed as a process. Um, one of the questions um, that came up was whether uh, zoning should be considered uh, three times a year or more than that. Um, there was some discussion about the fact that town meeting used to only consider zoning twice a year and um, now we're proposing to consider it three times a year and is that enough? Is that gonna be enough to cover all the things that wanna be changed? The other thing that um, people were talking about was um, what should be, who should really be um, the main body that is working on zoning. And in the past, we've always had the zoning subcommittee um, proposing zoning along with uh, planning department staff. And there was um, some interest in the idea that a new body could be formed that would be, um, a task force or a working group or something like that, that would probably be a multi-member body appointed by the town manager, although that wasn't discussed, but um, that, uh, you know, maybe what we need is a bigger group of people, not just three people on the zoning subcommittee to talk about zoning um, and include, um, you know, some of the business people in town and others who may be interested in, in zoning. Um, but then there was also consideration of an idea to uh, have zoning go through the CRC instead of going through um, the planning board. So in other words, um, the zoning changes might be generated by uh, town staff or others and be proposed to the CRC who would consider the zoning amendment and work on it and then present it to town council. And then at some point it would come back to the planning board for um, a public hearing because state law requires that the planning board hold a public hearing and make a recommendation on zoning amendments to the legislative body. So those were probably the three big things that I took out of that meeting. And there was a lot of discussion. And um, since Ms. McGowan was the person who really wanted to put this on the agenda tonight. I wondered if she, if, um, if the chair recognized her, if she wanted to talk more about this or emphasize something that I haven't emphasized. Um, 
um, let me find myself here. Um, so I've gone to a lot of, of the CRC meetings. Um, occasionally I make comments. I usually make, the format has changed a lot. Sometimes I comment in the beginning as a member of the public. Occasionally I'm allowed to comment um, on a substantive issue during their actual discussion. And um, so the CRC is handling zoning and planning and the people on, from the council have different levels of experience with this through either town meeting or being on the select board. Um, and then Steve Schreiber, who is obviously on the planning board and has deep experience. I've often been struck by, I mean, we're, they're doing planning and zoning and obviously we are too at this um, kind of lack of flow of information and communication between us. And I've, you know, I kind of, I think I've mentioned this previously. Like, I think that we need to have somebody, you know, as a liaison to the CRC. And I've mentioned to the CRC, they need a liaison to the planning board because, you know, we would naturally collaborate and work closely together um, on the master plan and on zoning. And so, so, and then there's CRC, has a whole new set of members. Some of them have been on before, but there's also new members. So they're in kind of a reset mode. And then they've been trying to figure out these processes for master plan update and zoning bylaw revisions and you know whatever. And so I think there's kind of a lack of communication between our board and the CRC members. And I just wonder if there's a way for us to kind of open it up and exchange ideas and experiences and kind of work better together. Like that's sort of how, you know, and that last meeting kind of took me aback to put it, you know, kind of in one, to characterize it in one way, because I just thought this is so different from what we've been hearing. And it's so different what we've been doing in the zoning subcommittee, which we have been struggling for a long time, trying to figure out how to work with the town council. And I just wonder if this is a good opportunity to kind of open up and have some joint meetings or more people participating and more conversation. But I think your summary, Christine, was excellent. Can't hear you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, there is communication between the chairs. Uh, and a lot of what they've been talking about has been talked about on and off for the last year, if not longer, ever since we've moved into a new form of government. And I think my feet, like what I'm seeing is that a lot of the town councilors want to re-examine um, sort of like the bylaw system because it's completely new and different. And this is a time of change because it used to be a town meeting and now it's town council. Um, how I see it, because I watched the meeting, is there's just a lot of dialogue right now, and they don't actually have a plan or a firm forward path. Uh, but I'm hoping that in the next month or so, um, they will be sending something to us. Um, and then it's time, you know, we will have to reflect on it and have some discussions. And there's other groups besides us that will feed into it, you know, ZBA and, and of course staff, there'll be lots of different groups that um, I'll have um, thoughts on whatever they're proposing. But Chris, my understanding right now, there's nothing, they're just really just looking at different options and I couldn't even tell if they were leaning towards one or the other. Last thought is there really was a lot of harping on looking to other towns or looking at Northampton. Um, I know I've been looking at like Arlington and how different towns are moving forward because you want it to be a success. I think we all agree that there needs to be a lot of bylaw changes and improvements. So I think everybody's on the same ship for that. And um, hopefully they'll come up with a good plan on how they want it to come to them through them and to town council. Uh, and I see David's hand up. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it seemed like that C the CRC meeting, there's a lot of process talk. Mm -hmm. And since I've been on the planning board, that's there's been a lot of process talk and it's understandable. It's a new form, new form of governance. Um, it's, I think that while thinking about process is one thing, Moving forward, it's it's time for us to, as we've discussed, both in the zoning subcommittee and at this body, I believe, 
presenting to or having discussion of, of actual substantive proposed zoning amendments and then handing that to the CRC or the town council and so that they, they can figure out, well, okay, here's the thing. What's our, what's the, what should be the process? Because it just continues to be, it feels to me like spinning wheels. And so have, while listening to the um, CRC meeting, I, you know, Rob Morrow was there too. And a lot, he's, and we had, sanctioned him and asked for him and, and encouraged him and his team to move forward with revisions, proposed revisions that would be um, uh, to help with the administration and the staffing uh, or the administration and, and the staff uh, use of the zoning bylaw. I think we should continue that and encourage Rob and participate in that again to give substance and meat to the CRC and the, and the town council so that they can decide what process they want, really. I think that my second and last point is that I think it would be useful for the planning board and perhaps the zoning subcommittee is to sort of noodle on what the goals of zone of any revisions would be. And I've got for example, I've got examples that when we consider revisions to the zoning bylaw and, and the development of the town, that, that, that it's important to consider land use and development and economic development hand in hand. So that it's not just about, so yeah. The second, the second thing is a second goal that I would suggest or propose for discussion is that that the zoning law conform with staff process, the process that, that the staff in the town hall goes through in order to approve proposed projects or work with proposed projects and that, that the, the zoning bylaw be um, clear and enabling rather than a hindrance. And the third goal I would say for any or principle for any revision would be that the zoning bylaw have sufficient flexibility to meet future changing unforeseen circumstances. So that it needs to be clear and present, but also flexible enough to address to address things that one can't anticipate today but might be might occur down the road, five, 10, 15 years. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. I recognize Michael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I agree with everything that Jack just said. Uh, so, David, that was why, <laughs> why, why do I keep calling you Jack? I think because Jack is right on the list right next to me. Anyway, um, sorry. Uh, I agree with everything you said. Um, and I would add two things to it, uh, which are not in any way contradictory to what you said. Uh, first, that um, it seems to me that, and I too watched the discussion of the CRC, it seems to me that most of the ideas that are coming up in that body complicate the process rather than simplify the process. And I think we have a reasonably simple process now it doesn't work because we don't ever get anything to the CRC and they don't do anything about what we do get to them. Uh, but if we started to get material to them, then they are the legislative body. Apparently we are not. We are the recommending body. They are the legislative body. And when they get stuff from us, recommendations, then they legislate. They do what they want with it. They put it through whatever committees they want to. We don't really send things to the CRC. We send things to the town council then the town council refers it back to the CRC and so on. And that's a council function. It's not our function. And if we go to the root of some task force, which involves people from the council, people from the business, people from the planning board, and, and anybody else from the public who, who would make it a representative body, 
uh, then we're just adding one more layer and maybe even two more layers because it might have to go back once to them and then back and then back and then back. We have to have a process at the planning board through the zoning subcommittee and the planning board, which is open to the participation of everybody who's involved when we have meetings, public meetings, public forums, whatever they have, they, are, they must be planning board forums. And we must take the responsibility of getting that in, getting recommendations as specific and well considered as we can make them to the council. Then the council can do what, with them what they will. Um, I have one more point. And I lost it. Maybe it'll come back to me and I'll jump back in. But that's, that's the way I, I'm seeing this process going right now. And I do think we need to get working. And oh, I know what it was. Um, <clears throat> many, many people in the, uh, at the CRC made the point or suggested that in some way uh, we should be doing, we should have this burden taken off. The planning board should have this burden taken off them because the planning board is too busy. Well, I submit that we are not that busy and that the CRC, if they're doing their job, ought to be a hell of a lot busier than we are. And I think if we take the responsibility of putting these zoning changes and doing the helping, uh, assisting and working with Rob to make the major changes, uh, organizational changes that he's anticipating, get those through the, our zoning committee and the planning board and then get them to the council I think that's the best thing we can do. And I think this fooling around with in trying to invent a process that we don't have control over is ridiculous. I think the planning board, uh, sorry, I think the council has to figure out what they want to do process wise and not involve us. So that's my say. Thank you. I recognize Maria. Um, thanks. I appreciate everybody's thoughts on process and, you know, wanting to, stay involved and understand <clears throat> that, you know, we just hit this pandemic and so everything kind of went on pause, but I think it's a little early right now to get deep into a discussion about um, process and how we're moving forward because uh, the CRC hasn't figured out with Rob Mora exactly what they're even thinking. They sort of threw out a lot of big picture ideas and nothing was actually resolved. So. I mean, as much as I'd like to keep going on about like um, what we think the process should be or what we should do, I don't think we should be reacting to anything they've said because they didn't really say anything in my opinion. Um, honestly, I, I feel like um, they're going through exactly what we already went through, which is talk to Rob and talk to about process and what could work and who should be involved. So I say we just give it uh, however long, a few weeks just because we can't get together and work anyways. Um, why sort of deliberate about which group or which task force, which committee gets formed? Um, I think we should just see what they propose. Um, let Rob keep, you know, doing what he hopefully is doing in between all his other tasks that he has day to day and go from there. Um, I, I feel like, yeah, going around in circles and talking about process ourselves is sort of, you know, doing the same frustrating Thing that we saw them do, which is, um, you know, it's nice to talk to you guys, but I, I feel like it is a little premature to just go deep into, you know, what next steps are at this point. So, um, yeah, I wonder if we can just table this perhaps because um, they didn't really give us, I guess, a clear path forward and we don't have one either. And a lot of it's in Rob Morris plate. So, um, Yep, that's it. Thank you. Um, Janet? So I'm glad we're having this discussion and I, I really, I'm just, I'm really getting a lot from it. Um, I think the town council and the planning board and the town staff, all we all have the same goal of a better zoning bylaw. Um, we may have different paths to it, but I think simplicity and flexibility and you know lack of contradictions is a great idea. I think that we should proceed with the zoning subcommittee and our work and working with Rob and, you know, just chugging along um, because under statute changes can always come from the planning board. They can come from the public. They can come from a town counselor 
for the CRC for proposals. So I think we should do that. I think that I really did feel like one of my big feelings after the meetings I've attended for CRC is that the plant, this board has had a lot of experience with zoning changes, um, proposals, going to town meeting, the process, and how hard it is to actually draft and get things through. And I thought that I was hoping that I, would, I think it just needs even more communication and information exchanged. And we don't control what the town council process is going to be. And um, we can kind of take care of our piece of it, of what we do. But I really do think that there just needs to be more communication and information going back and forth. And I was just, maybe I'm just, you know, maybe it's a simple thing of just encouraging people to attend CRC meetings or um, us have a liaison who just, I don't know, I just, I just feel like, you know, it's like I, everybody seems to be in a kind of parallel universe and I'm kind of jumping back and forth between them thinking there's so much experience in the planning board and ideas that, you know, information or just kind of, they could talk through things. You guys could talk through some of the ideas with the different CRC members. So I don't know um, if that's appealing to people or just, it was just an idea I had. Thank you. I see no more hands. Um, so I'm going to move on to item B, old business. Topics not reasonably anticipated in 48 hours prior to the meeting. Chris, is there anything? Nope. Nope. Okay. And then item five, new business. Topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. Any, nothing. Wait, uh, Janet, you want to say something? I don't know if this is old business or new business, but I'm just not getting my packet until like three times I've gotten it on a Tuesday and the last two have come on Tuesday, but fortunately my mailman's coming a little early er. And then once I got it on Wednesday and I just wonder if there's a, if I know it's kind of a big ask for the planning department, but if you could mail it out a day earlier, like on Thursday, is that, or, or is there some way for me to get, cause I, it just seems to be getting later and later. I know the post office is also struggling because of the pandemic. And so I don't know what other people's experiences are, but I can, I can tell you mine over the last five years, my packet comes either Monday. I mean, I'm sorry, it comes Tuesday or Wednesday. Once in a blue moon, it's come on a Monday, but that's why I really appreciate how our packets are coming through the email now. So it's actually to me an improvement because now I look at the packet on Friday or Saturday or Sunday where I never could before until Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I, I'm probably thinking other members probably are the same thing with mail, but hopefully the email is, is helping. Um, I do see, uh, I, I, Chris, you can address, I mean, I, I think this has come up over the years because before we had that email, you know, it, sometimes when we had a really heavy agenda, it's really hard to get it on Wednesday. Um, and we had asked Chris, but they're really pressed, you know, to get it out earlier than what they do on Friday. Um, I don't see her or if Pam have a comment. Um, I'll go to Michael. Do you have something to add to this, Michael? No, it's a totally different issue. Okay, hold then one sec. Let me just check. Jack, you have your hand up. Jack? Yes, yes. Um, I'm just saying at this point in time, I am totally relying on digital media. When I get mail, I'm like, I don't even really want to touch it at this point in time. <laughs> That's a Given good where point. We are, I, I don't, but I know that everything is delivered to me via email. So I, I slide it in over into a folder on, you know, on Google Drive. Um, and I don't really want mail from the town right now or in the future because we have advanced technologically as as a nation and as a world that do we really need paper copies of anything at this point in time? You I know, mean, Jack, I'm well, really glad you brought this up. I completely agree with you. Now that we have the electronic, um, I used to really just want, you know, the packet, the paper was for the drawings and figures, but they are so much better to look at online. You can zoom in, um, move them, layer them. Like it, anyways, um, I am willing to forgo my paper packet. Maybe we can have that discussion at another time because I'd rather save the trees and I really, you're right, I don't want to touch the mail right now. So um, it's, it's 
different. I, I'm going to go to Chris because her hand is up right now. And then I'll go back to uh, Janet and Michael. I know you're still on. So board. one thing um, uh, we tried, I think this was probably before the shutdown, was that um, some people came in to pick up packets. So David Levenstein came in a few times to pick up his packet because he didn't want to have to wait for the mail to arrive. So, you know, usually Pam has the packets done sometime afternoon. And, you know, if somebody really wanted to come and pick up a packet, I could walk out to the parking lot and hand it to them. Um, so that's something that we can offer if you want to do that on a Friday afternoon. Um, and then if you don't come, I guess I'll take it to the post office. So, you know, you'd probably want or to- Or they could, them. or they could set up with you that they just pick it up on Monday or something or they Tuesday. Okay. So if people mm -hmm. want to do that, um, they'd have to set that up in advance because, you know, obviously Pam would get to get the mail out on Friday afternoon if it's, if it needs to be mailed. So I guess we're offering, if anybody wants to have a packet to pick up, let us know by, you know, probably Thursday evening, and we will be able to put that packet aside and give it to you whenever you feel like driving into the parking lot and picking it up. Great. And we could have the option to say no packet. And you could have that option. Okay. So give that some thought, people, um, as we try to move into more and more into the digital age. Um, Janet, I see your hand. Oh, no, nope, she took her hand down. So she, um, Jack, your hand's up. Jack? Yeah, I was just going to say it's, it's kind of ironic that we're doing these meetings via Zoom. <laughs> and we're thinking that we need, that's all. Uh, but, um, I understand two screens help in this situation, but I, I use two I, screens. Yeah. Yeah. I just would encourage, you know, people to like, in, you know, increase their technology just a tad bit. <laughs> and I don't think really we need paper. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I set up a laptop next to my, my desktop and utilize that. So, you know, play around with what you can and, um, Thank you. Uh, so if there's no more discussion on that, I'm going to move to Michael. Is this under new business, Michael? Um, well, it would be like a, a committee report, but we're not, we, they're not on the agenda, but I do have something I think oh. you know about. <laughs> yeah. Good the point. Review board. It's free. <laughs> uh, the design review board met last week to review a proposal from the bid to put a mural on the side of the, Mich the Michelson building. Uh, in that in that parking lot area behind the bank, near the cinema, uh, there's a big, broad brick wall back there. They wanted to put a mural on there. Uh, the, all five members of the design review board had issues with the particular project, uh, and to to the point at which, to the point that uh, uh, Ms. Gould decided or said at the at the meeting that well she was not going to bring that that proposal back again. So it was uh, taken by her, uh, apparently, with some hard feelings. I, I'm not sure about that, but uh, it seemed a very abrupt withdrawal of a proposal, which had some merit to it, but had many problems, uh, different kinds of problems from, the point of, from all five different points of view of the board members. So that's just for your information. Thank you. And do you actually, for them to put it up, do they have to get approval from someone, or was this a nice uh, to know? Well, the, the the design review board is an uh, advisory board. Okay, but maybe this gives them some thought to go back and and give it some more thought. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Glad did you guys? And this was through Zoom. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's true. Does anyone else have any other committee reports? I know a lot of committees aren't meeting. Um, show your hand if, if you have something you'd like to um, report. Uh, if not, I'm going to move on to uh, item uh, six, which is... Christine, Chris oh. Brestrup has her hand up. Oh, she does. Chris, thank you. I just wanted to um, speak on behalf of the bid. Mm. I know that they had a uh, difficult meeting with the DRB and they um, seem to be um, 
sort of miffed at the reception that they received. But just to put a little uh, different spin on it, they are trying so hard to help the businesses that are, you know, essentially failing in downtown Amherst. And they're working really hard to get um, some money from some small business administration loans or something. They've set up a foundation that was originally going to be used for um, downtown uh, improvements like the, the shell, if, if we want to call it that, you know, the musical shell um, and other things, but they're turning their attention now to helping the businesses downtown. And I think that um, perhaps their frame of mind was colored by this, um, you know, difficult situation that they're going through and they're trying to help. And so um, anyway, I just wanted to put that out there that they, may not have reacted the way they would react in normal times. Thank you, Chris. Um, I recognize Michael. Uh, I'm sure that's true, Chris. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they did bring it forward to us. Uh, they could have withdrawn it without any difficulty at all. Uh, and I understand that the funding is an issue for them. Uh, and I'm understanding, I understand and appreciate the fact that their funding efforts are going entirely towards supporting small businesses in the area, which is wonderful. Uh, but I just felt the need to report on this uh, because that's what the design review board is all about. Thank you. Um, I recognize uh, Janet. So um, just to support um, what Christine was saying is at the CRC meeting, um, the bid and um, um, the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce, they had a really excellent presentation. And I don't know, maybe Chris, you could send that out to the board. It was really quite comprehensive what they're working on. I thought it was useful for people to know. I didn't, I didn't cite it in my notes because I didn't have um, the link and stuff like that. That was, they had a really fine, ex their whole view of what they're trying to do and trying to use this as an opportunity to move Amherst forward and stuff like that. So it was very impressive. Uh, Christine? So if I remember to do that, I will send you a link, but you can also go on the CRC page. And I think that they included that in their packet after the fact. I think they got it late before their meeting and, um, and it should be on the CRC webpage in case I forget to uh, find that and forward it, okay? But it was definitely worthwhile watching that and, and hearing about the foundation and hearing about the opportunity for all of us to contribute to that. I did watch the whole CRC meeting and uh, their presentation was very informative and um, my family is definitely making an effort to do a lot of takeout from downtown and I have to say I won't mention specific but the ones that we've been going to really have very good technique and nice systems that they've set up. You can just call ahead, place your order. It's just waiting for you, you know, pay ahead with a credit card. Um, we usually try to stick a gratuity in there, but I highly recommend it. And I have a bunch of uh, young adult children. They really seem to need some of that food that's down there. <laughs> so um, I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna move on to the next item. Um, Pam, in case you're just hanging out there, could you pop up the agenda again just so the public can see where we're at? Um, so I'm going to item six. It's Form A, a and R subdivision applications. Do we have any of those? Yes. Um, so I don't know if I'm muted or not muted. No, you. we hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so we do have an ANR, and it's related to the uh, things that Tom Reedy was talking to us about before. Um, it's essentially, um, you know, splitting the lot in two, in, uh, you know, with that lot line running um, straight north and then off to the northwest. And um, the plan that you're looking at right now that Pam's brought before you is, in fact, the ANR plan. And if you would authorize... Um, Christine Gray Mullen to sign it, then she and I can make an arrangement to have her come to town hall to sign it. Uh, should we have a show of hands or everyone want to just click their hand on for a sec if you're good with that? I I'm see good David's with it. Hand. Okay, I heard some. Yep, there's Maria, Doug, um, Jack. 
Great. So I've seen almost all of your hands. Great. Thank you. You can turn them off. Chris, uh, we'll figure out how I should come by and do that. Yeah, I'll call that a consensus. Yes. Yeah. Great. And um, item, we'll move to seven, is upcoming ZBA applications. Um, yes, we do have ZBA applications, and I had them all lined up here. And what did I do with them? Here they are. Um, okay, so Colonial Village um, is coming before the ZBA to alter their, uh, their approval for the um, development in general. They have acquired a playground from um, North Village. North Village is, you know, undergoing changes. They're, um, you know, demolishing the buildings and building new buildings there. So they're giving their playground to Colonial Village. I don't know exactly if there's a monetary transaction there or not, but it's pretty nice play equipment and they want to install it at Colonial Village. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is 948 East Pleasant Street. Um, apparently there's a, a woman there who wants to put in an eight foot high uh, fence and um, uh, she is reacting to some difficulties in, in the neighborhood. And so uh, the ZBA will be considering whether she should be allowed to put in an eight foot high fence. And then um, 65 High Street, um, it is, I believe it's, I don't know if it's a single family house or a duplex, but there's some special permit that's needed to um, either acknowledge or create a duplex there at 65 High Street. And that's it. That's all. Thank I you. Know. Thanks, Chris. I uh, will move on to, I see no hands, uh, eight upcoming SPP, SPR, SUVs applications. Yep. So, um, you know, you have the Kendrick Park uh, playground coming to you on May 6th. And um, we won't have all of the details worked out by then, but we'll have more than we had on April 15th. So I think um, you'll be able to comment and then probably want to continue the public hearing to May 20th so that we can really, um, you know, acknowledge all of the details. Then Russ Wilson, who's a, a builder, is uh, building houses down at the Applebrook Cluster subdivision. So one of the houses that he's built, the owner of that house would like to put on a, a deck and, um, and a three season room. So he needs to come to you for um, a change and modification of his site plan review. Um, All About Learning is a preschool in the Pomeroy Village area uh, on Pomeroy Lane. And they um, occupy some space in 7 Pomeroy Lane, which is the building right next to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they'd like to expand their play area. Um, they had a proposal to do that at a different location a couple of years ago, but they but that didn't really go through. Uh, and then Amherst Media is just on the brink of submitting their site plan review application to you after having gotten approval from the uh, local historic district. And um, recently, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has upheld the decision of the uh, local historic district. So, so that's going to be coming to you. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, all I have right now. Uh, just a quick question on the first one, Kendrick Park. So that'll come back to us, won't be complete. So we'll send it to the next meeting, which is um, ooh, uh, end of May. Are we, I assume we're going to do a meeting at the end of May. But wasn't there a deadline, a June deadline or something with the grant or something? Well, Yes, there is. And that deadline may be extended, but it hasn't been extended yet. So I thought as we could get as much done on May 6th as possible. And then we hope that we'll just need to come back with some final details to you on May 20th and that we'll be able to wrap it up before the deadline on June 1st. But maybe I'll have good news for you next week and be able to say the deadline's been extended. But um, since it hasn't been yet, we need to push forward with that one. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Report of Chair, the only thing I had is a little bit about scheduling. Uh, we're sort of rolling again here and we have um, a meeting uh, next week uh, on the 6th and then we have it on the 20th and then it would be June 3rd. So that's what we're looking at right now. Do you want to know other things that are coming up on those two dates? 
that uh, that would be helpful. Yes, I see some nodding. Yes. Okay, so on the sixth, you're going to have the consultants for the 40R district coming to you with um, a presentation about you know what they've done in general and what they're doing right now, and also a proposal for a zoning amendment that would incorporate um, what 40R is all about, including design guidelines. So they're going to be making a presentation on May 6th. And then on May 20th, on May 20th, I think um, we decided that, that I would come and give you an update on the master plan and where, we're, where we are with the master plan. So you long ago had sent us out um, an example of one of the chapters, I think the land use. Um, and we were supposed to get back to you with comments and then all this happened. Should we reset? And what are your expectations of us right now? Yeah, if you want to read it and uh, send me some comments, that would be fine. Um, and possibly I'll have some more done by then, but uh, I don't know. It's it, just to let you know, this is an uh, unusual situation. I work in town hall most of the time. Other people don't work in town hall. So there are a lot of things that need to be done to coordinate all of this work. And that actually takes up a lot of time. So for my actual work, it's hard to actually work and get it done. <laughs> just wanted to share that with you. But um, possibly by the 20th, I will have more than just chapter three ready for your review. Okay, that would be great. Thank you for trying. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll be into June. Um, Thank you. Is there a report of staff? And after that, I still have to stick in public comment. I don't think we will have any, but just in case. Oh, I- Excuse I me, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, I see your hand. Um, I, I don't recall the draft chapter three land use. Can you either resend or just let me know where, what the time frame was so I could try to find it? Sure, yep, I will send it. And by the 20th for that meeting, I will also uh, reach out to Brianna and IT and see if they're lightening up and have any bandwidth so we can get that website up. All right. May I make a plea as part of my yeah. report? Which is that if you could, I, I don't know if you're all planning on taking vacations this summer or if you're gonna stick mm -hmm. close to home. But if you are planning to take a vacation, it would be good if you could send me that information because then I would know um, you know, how to plan uh, planning board meetings, whether we're going to have a quorum for some of the uh, dates that we have. Um, and, and you can, you know, look at the calendar and count on having a meeting scheduled for the first Wednesday and the third Wednesday, um, you know, to have an idea. I think I've sent you a planning board schedule, but if not, I, I'll do that again. Summer vacation. So what does that mean? Like, we just don't go to a planning board Zoom meeting and stay at home, or do we actually get to leave our houses? I don't know. Kinda, it's kind of weird to plan for summer vacation. Yeah. Uh, um, but yes, thank you. Um, I also want to say that since we'll be entering June, I think there's three of us that are up for reappointment. Um, and the steps for that are, are we supposed to fill out a form? Um, I would if I were you. Um, let's see, Christine Gray Mullen and Michael Burtwistle and the other one? Is there another one or is it all? It, is David? Yeah, I, I was thinking David. Yep, there's three of us. David also. Okay, so I think it would be advisable to fill out the CAF. Um, you know, if you can dig out your old one, send that along. But um, I never know from time to time what the requirements are going to be. So I, I err on the caution side and have people send in the form and that sort of prompts people in the office upstairs to consider um, consider your application. And uh, they recently, the town council recently appointed um, a number of members to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that's really good because they were down to only four people. So um, they'll be able to carry on with their work. So I, I hope that you all, uh, the ones who have their your terms coming up, um, will agree to keep serving. and. Um, look forward to keep serving with you. Um, I just, because there doesn't seem to be any rules. They've tried other process interviews and stuff like that, but they don't seem, 
it's unclear how to proceed. I also wonder in the charter, it says that there's three year terms. They've been giving less than that to replace members. But like Michael and I, um, he'll, he's closing in on his fourth year and myself on my fifth. Um, would it be for three year terms? That's my question to them. Um, they seem to be sticking that they want the six year max. So um, that would mean Michael only would get a two and I would get a one. It's just, you know, when you're weighing um, your commitment and um, life, uh, mm -hmm. the difference between one year and three year is, is quite a bit different. So I was wondering if you can reach out to them mm -hmm. or are they, you know, I don't know if Michael has any feelings on that. I see his hand. I'll call him Michael. Yeah, I do. I filled out an application and as part of the application, I said I would be interested in serving a three-year term. Which would be for a total of seven. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they have no actual rule. It's just right. and something they've, they've been saying, but it's unclear. Thank you. Um, David has his hand up too. Yeah, I, do. I see Jack also. Um, I'll call on Jack first. Uh, Jack, is that it? <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> um, and you, you guys can raise your hands again if you change your mind. Oh, All right. Sorry. Oh, there okay. it's back. Hello. I thought I unclicked it. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that I think, uh, Christine, you're doing a great job. And, <laughs> and I really would like to see you continue for whatever, you know, one, two, three, you know, whatever the next assignment is. Um, Thank but you. I know I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, the vice chair and it would be, I mean, it's telling everyone on the board that uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like you just, I hate to see what happened like before with the Garter chairman because it's just such tumultuous times. Let's keep some, you know, con, you know, consistency to what we're doing. I think it's good and that's all. Thank you, Jack. I enjoy working with all of you. Chris, you're just up, okay. All right, so we'll go to, well, it's back to the beginning. Let me just go to item two, public comment period. Um, I'm just first gonna see if there is anyone who wants public comment. Um, I only see one attendee right now, the hand is not up. Um, uh, Pam, just checking, there's no phone calls. No, ma'am. Okay, so we can pass through that. And if there's no other hands or anything, I think we can move to item nine, adjournment. And thank you all. Yay. We'll see Thank you, you all. <laughs> Stay job. safe. Happy Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh, we did we did good. Thank you, Chris. And Pam, you did great. Thank you. Oh wait Thank a minute. You. We gotta stop recording. <laughs> 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 because I want to stop.